In this short video, I'll just run through the last section of the lecture on Central Asia, uh, that which covers the economic and social development in the region. In this first slide, I'll be talking about Table 10.2 from the book, Indicators of Development. So kind of each row is a different country in the region, and each column here is a different indicator. We have things like uh, gross national income per capita, GDP average annual growth, a composite human development index, and then more specifically things like life expectancy, different mortality rates, adult literacy, and gender inequality. So as I discussed on Monday, these countries vary primarily in the um, amounts or their abundance of oil and natural gas. Looking back at a map in the book, we can see in green oil and gas basins underlying much of the land of Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and at least western Kazakhstan. Some basins extending into Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, but there's a clear difference between these three nations, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, whose economies um, largely re resolve, revolve excuse me, around oil gas extraction um, and reap the benefits from the export of those resources. Uzbekistan, which does have some other natural resources to draw on, and then Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, that largely don't. In Afghanistan, they don't have uh, too much oil and gas, but mineral resources are abundant. Uh, it's really just kind of a, an issue of extracting them. Those differences in resource abundance are reflected in this GNI per capita. Whereas Kazakhstan here has a value of 11,000, Azerbaijan nearly 9,000, these vary to as low as 1,100 for Afghanistan, a kind of low single-digit thousands for the other countries. Um, Kazakhstan, in good years, having GNI per capita similar to almost approaching that of Russia. Um, of course, the abundance of oil and gas and the orientation of economic development around that does expose the economy to uh, boom and bust cycles in the commodity. So they are large producers, but they're not the only and not the largest globally. Um, things like overall global economic activity or different rates of production uh, can impact the price they can get, um, impact the amount um, that they would produce and can lead to uh, somewhat destructive cycles. So even if they're operating uh, at a level of higher national income, um, can be exposed to, again, boom and bust cycles, kind of uh, recession conditions uh, that wouldn't be as manifest in countries with smaller economies. Looking at the other countries uh, that have maybe more diversified economies or um, have economies that don't really have the option <laughs> to become uh, focused on oil and gas extraction, Uzbekistan uh, contains a lot of cotton agriculture. And if you remember, this is directly linked to uh, some of the landforms that are fairly common in Central Asia. So mountains surrounded by arid uh, deserts or grasslands um, that have rivers running down from the mountains. And these rivers bring water into otherwise desert areas, um, but also transport good quality sediment so that the soils in these alluvial areas is very good for growing. We can kind of see some of those rivers coming down. We talked about the Bragana Valley here with area shared by Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. Kyrgyzstan also 
uh, has worked to strengthen its agricultural sector. Tajikistan, Tajik, in the southeast of the region here, uh, it has uh, the low, lowest GNI per capita along with Kyrgyzstan outside of Afghanistan. So it's somewhat tiered here. Uh, they rely on emigration, so people leaving the country, working as migrants, uh, largely in Russia, um, could be Kazakhstan as a destination, and sending money back. Um, they're also hoping to develop uh, domestic hydroelectric power generation capacity, uh, taking advantage of the sometimes very fast-flowing rivers um, and kind of filling a gap uh, left by the lack of hydrocarbon resources, like oil and gas. Also taking advantage of its location, kind of right between some of the more developed areas in the west and China to the east, South Asia to the south. Here's a map color coding the human development index. So this again is a kind of a composite index, takes into account things like life expectancy, um, literacy levels, income, kind of purple values higher into the orange and yellow values the lowest. Kind of Afghanistan stands out in the region as having very low human development index. Um, partially that's a case of uh, the wars that have been endemic since more or less the 1980s or very late 1970s there. Um, highest values seen in the parts of this Central Asian region that are within China, so specifically Xinjiang and Mongolia, Inner Mongolia here. Um, so those were included in the region uh, partially for climate reasons, I guess, maybe partially for culture as well in Xinjiang. Um, but they're within China. They're kind of uh, benefiting from infrastructure investments there, um, government distribution of money, and um, an economy that's not as reliant on hydrocarbon resource extraction and export like Kazakhstan, say, or Azerbaijan even. Kind of within Central Asia, uh, these four countries Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan, Tibet, and Mongolia in this kind of intermediate to low range here. You're just running through some of uh, the bigger issues uh, in social development in Central Asia, specifically uh, treatment status of women. Um, in Afghanistan, noticeably uh, worse conditions for gender equality than the other countries. Um, Afghanistan was um, governed by a, a, a regime in the 80s that was sympathetic to the Soviets, uh, but was never um, part of the USSR or kind of a, a, a fully integrated satellite state, and so would not have... Um, at least the, the policies towards stated goals of gender equality that were pushed forward by the communists wouldn't have um, much time to really take root there. Um, but that is, to some degree, the case in many of the Central Asian countries that were part of the USSR. So here, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. Um, however, the kind of recent historical legacy is at odds with um, some of the longer-rooted um, kind of practices that are uh, linked to, to cultural reproduction in the area. So specifically the concept of bride kidnapping. So this um, being a kind of a performative process where women are abducted by men um, can vary from being you know, what we would think of as legal kidnapping, um, sexual assault, uh, non-consensual, essentially, or to more, um, well, as I say, performative, where um, there's um, the woman might have foreknowledge and goes through it as a, a bit of a ritual. Um, it's not really um, widely accepted the prevalence of this activity, 
Um, but the estimates are between, say, 10 and, and 30 or 40 percent of marriages um, in recent decades. Um, and among those, it's also not clear about how many are um, kind of done with knowledge or how many are, are, as we say, like what we would recognize in the U.S. as legal kidnapping, as sexual assault. Oh, another thing here that um, at a global level, kind of poverty um, is higher poverty is related to uh, more inequality between genders, kind of worse treatment of women. So that's kind of a broad correlation um, in areas like Europe that have a uh, high per capita income. Treatment is typically more equal in poorer countries, less equal. In Central Asia, um, we saw kind of a range of uh, poverty levels. None of the countries are especially rich, um, but there's a, a kind of a clear difference with the exception of Afghanistan along that uh, range from Kazakhstan down to kind of Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. Um, and within that range, again, accepting Afghanistan, uh, status of women is, is, again, not equal, but uh, more equal than you might expect given uh, the prevalence of poverty in the region.